Well, welcome to another episode of Sisters and Saints. I'm Kim Tizer, and this is not Carol Berry. Um, unfortunately, my co-host Carol couldn't be with us today because she is homesick with the flu. So if you think about it, please pray for her so she can join us next week. Now, if you've been watching um, on Facebook, some of our videos there, you may have seen a recent promo stating that we were taking the show on the road. And uh, so we're doing that today. And I'm so sorry Carol couldn't be here for this, our very first episode doing this, because she is friends with our guest, Brother Christopher. Welcome, Brother Christopher. Thank you. <laughs> you know, I was thinking we really should have changed the name of the show just for this episode from Sisters and Saints to Brothers and Saints. I think that would have been maybe a better fit. With, yeah. yeah? <laughs> I, I agree, yes. <laughs> well, I'm sure there's someone watching um, who's a lot like I am, who is not familiar at, at all with what it means to be a monk, what you do, uh, the discernment that was required to enter the monastery. Um, so we're going to talk about that, but before we do, I think it might be a good idea to mention where we are. Can you tell us that, Brother Christopher? Well, we are at Ave Maria Grotto at St. Bernard Abbey in Coleman, Alabama. Mm -hmm. uh, we're at the Grotto gift shop. Yeah, and this is beautiful. And the grounds here, if you've not been here, are beautiful. They're also peaceful. And I was visiting with Brother Christopher just before we started here, and you were saying people can just come out here and and walk around and just take in the, the serene setting. Um, is it open all the time for people to come here and what can they do while they're here? Well, we're open seven days a week. In uh, spring, we're open until 6 p.m. And in the fall, starting October 1st, our hours are nine to five. And the only days we close are Christmas, Easter, Thanksgiving, and New Year's. The rest of the time we are open to the public. Okay, and so there's a chapel here. That is, is that open to the public? Yes, yes, we have two chapels actually. We have uh, the, the cemetery chapel, um, which we also have a columbarium out there. And then our Abbey Church, which is about 50 yards from the grotto, is open to the public. And uh, we have daily mass as well as our Sunday mass service which is open to the public. And we're going to get to your story in a minute, but before we do, uh, since you did mention we're right here at Ave Maria Grotto, a beautiful place. Can you explain a little bit about what it is? Because I know when I first moved to Alabama, I heard about the grotto and I was like, what's a grotto? I don't even know what it is. So how would you explain this location to others? Well, grotto is Latin for cave. Oh. And Ave Maria is Hail Mary, mm -hmm. and you know Mary was the mother of God, and uh, hence we have uh, uh, many grottos out here with the Blessed Mother, um, and of course uh, there's also churches throughout the world. the The grotto is works of a, a certain monk that was here about. 70 years, uh, uh, Brother Joseph Zodel mm -hmm. uh, came over here as a teenager in 1891 when the monastery was founded. He came from Germany, didn't he? Did, yes. did I read that correctly? Okay, I think from I From Landshut, Bavaria. Okay. Uh, his stepmother and father wanted him to come over here for an education. And he alone built all the little um, I'm not sure the not statues. What what would you call the little houses and and structures? The, well, the miniatures. Miniature, uh, yeah, miniatures. Yeah. Yeah. I, I tell people he was a, a folk artist. Okay. So um, he did um, the constructions from donations from people, uh, shells, marbles, um, and uh, actual marble, and um, they were from different places around the world. And uh, the unique thing about it is there's only two things that he, in fact, saw, which was his uh, baptismal church, St. Martin's in Bavaria, and then uh, Castle Trostnitz. And so everything else he based off of postcards, is that right? Yeah, pictures and postcards and his imagination. 
Wow. And it was all to glorify God. And it's really beautiful. I don't know mm -hmm. how many structures are out here, or if you know, but... There's over a hundred. Over a hundred. And mm -hmm. you can just take your time walking around and taking it in, take pictures. It's really a beautiful, beautiful place, a beautiful sight to see. So why don't we get to your story, Brother Christopher? And first off, just uh, tell us a little bit about where you're from originally. Do you have siblings? And maybe what you did before you started looking at the religious life. Okay. <clears throat> I originally was born in Indiana, okay. Richmond, Indiana to be precise. Uh, and I, at the age of 25, followed my parents down to Montgomery, Alabama. My dad had uh, a new job opportunity. I'm the second oldest of six children. Wow. So uh, I came down there, um, or went down there I believe it was 1982, and so uh, I spent the next 34 years there okay. uh, in Montgomery, and uh, then that was the second part of my life, and then the third part of my life, I tell people, was at the age of 55, I entered uh, St. Bernard Abbey. Okay. I'm going to write that down, just so I don't forget. I like to take mo uh, notes, if that's okay. A year or two. That's okay. So growing up, um, would you say, was your family very religious? Was yeah. that an important part of family life? Yes, uh, weekly church attendance for sure. And then I went to a Catholic grade school and my grandmother, my maternal grandmother was a very pious holy woman. And uh, uh, we, or I saw what it was like to be faithful to God. She was a very dedicated woman, and I saw the love of God through her and my mom. Mm -hmm. And just being in a large family, I consider that a gift. And I consider, you know, just being taught by religious sisters in my uh, early education a tremendous gift. So that instilled in me the beauty of religious life. Mm -hmm. So do you remember when you were younger at any point thinking, you know, maybe I'd like to enter religious life myself. Maybe I'd like to be a priest. I mean, did that cross your mind as a young boy? Well, oftentimes in my situation, my grandmother, the, 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 the thing that I always remember hearing her saying is, uh, oh, we need priests, there's a shortage of priests. And so she planted that seed like, um, you know, my name, in Ke was Kevin, and she said, we, we, need, we need priests. And so um, I saw that as uh, an aspiration, something that I wanted to do. Mm -hmm. uh, not just because my grandmother thought it was a good idea, but I just saw the love of the church, and I wanted to serve God that way. Okay. And I know only a little bit of your story, not that much, but from Carol, who again couldn't be here today. But I know from that that you didn't enter religious life like as soon as you left home, right? I mean, your path yeah. kind of took yeah. some twists and turns, it right? Took twists and turns. Um, you know, I got the thought as early as grade school. Oh, wow. You know, wow. I wanted to do this. Um, so I applied for diocesan seminary after high school, and they told me, they said, well, we think you should go to college, and then if you still want to, then come back. So instead what I did is I went to college, and because of the rigor and you know the difficulty of college, I thought, well, I'm just gonna go get a job and work. Mm -hmm, so that's mm -hmm. what I did. Okay. I went and got a job and uh, that was out of high school and uh, put God on the back burner and didn't think about it anymore for at least 20 years. Was he still tugging at your heart though periodically like, hey Kevin, I'm still calling you or had you just really put him out of your mind? Well, I just, yeah, I put the wall up. I said, you know, you know not yet or, you know, I marginalized my faith. I um, stopped going to church. Uh, there were other things I wanted to do, so mm -hmm. you know, God wasn't important. Right. 
And um, so that's what I did. So at what point did he finally get a hold of you and say, Kevin, enough's enough. You know, you know I've called you. What happened? Well, um, let's say I did, let's see, I probably would have been in my mid-30s, my late 30s. I, uh, I should say that I, after I left my faith, I uh, rode the path of a little bit of destruction, okay. you know, and qualified myself for uh, a recovery and 12-step program. Mm -hmm. um, I'm a friend of Bill W's. And uh, so after doing that for approximately 10 years, I decided I wanted to get closer to God. I wanted to get closer to God, and I had this, my yearning for God was rekindled, and... Um, I assume you recognized something had been missing during that time. That's there was correct. That, void. that yeah. would be correct, yeah. yes. So, I just had an aha moment, and I thought, well, you know, maybe I just need to go back to church, <laughs> and, which I did, and, you know, I marginalized my faith partly too. I thought, you know, my mom was always saying, well, you need to go to church, you need to go to church. And like any good rebellious child, you're going to put the wall and say, no. <laughs> I'd like to do things my way for a little while. And that's what I know? did. So after my uh, started my, I will say my path of recovery, I, uh, you know, decided I want to get that close, or wanted to get close to God and frequent church attendance, receiving the sacraments, um, being around good holy men and people. I uh, eventually uh, applied for diocesan seminary again. And then the same answer that happened when I was 18 happened again and they said, uh, you know, we'll go to school because I never completed college and then come back and see us. And then so at the same time, I had a teenage niece who was wayward, and I thought, well, she needed to find a good old correctional school. So I looked at all Alabama, all the places that could be, and I thought, St. Bernard Abbey, they have a school. So let's find out if they, you know, take people like my niece. And I quickly learned that it's not a, it's a college preparatory school. It's not for kids with behavioral problems. Mm -hmm. So. Uh, after I found that out, somebody invited me to come on a discernment weekend here for religious life, and uh, and had you considered that at that point? I mean, before I you were kind of what, thinking. I didn't even know what it was like. You I didn't mean, know, like no, I didn't. Got know an what, invite, gonna go. I you didn't know, know what a Benedictine out. was. I didn't know what a monk was. <laughs> I'd never seen a monk. I don't even wow. know if I had heard of them before. Right. All I was familiar with was sisters or right. or priests. I knew what, who they were, uh -huh. what they looked so like. So you didn't even know, but you're like, sure, I'm game, I let's go, like, you know? So, yeah. So uh, I came back. Uh, I answered the, the vocation weekend, and I was invited to apply. And so I applied, and they said, okay. So that was when I was 44. And I uh, entered the monastery. That was originally in 2002. Okay, 2002. I'm just so, going to jot that down. Yeah. And so what is that discernment time period like? Like how long is it? And what kinds of things were you praying about? I mean, was there a part of you that wondered like, boy, is it, God, is this really where you're leading me? Or did you feel this peace that this is what I need to do? Well, I should probably say uh, a lot of my story is I wanted to fix my family. Mm. You know, I, I didn't care how I fixed it. And the more I prayed, the more I prayed. And, you know, I think God led me to this because he thought, you know, maybe this is how you're going to fix your family. I can't fix my family. Only God can. So, you know, through prayer and seeking God's will in my life, it led me to the Abbey here, it led me to community life. And so, just for clarification for someone who might be watching and wondering, when you say fix your family, you're not talking about you were married with three kids at the time. No. You're talking about extended No, I'm talking family, about my family. Church, I guess you'd say God. my family of origin, 
my siblings coming from a big family, uh, you know, which is so typical today. There's lots of addiction in families. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. My family sure. has not been spared that. So uh, uh, that's, that's what I wanted to do. I wanted everybody to be okay. So how long was the process of, of entering the monastery, you know, from the time you started until they said you're now Brother Christopher, and you know, what does that look like? So, okay, we'll back up to 2002. I stayed for two months, left, because I felt like I had to be involved with helping my sisters raise their families, and I just wasn't ready to let go of the past or let go of my family. So I left for another 10 years. Okay, okay. So, so that was not, that was not it for me when I entered. So finally, in 2013, is when I entered for the last time. Okay. And so how long did that take? Once you came back, is that a long process? It's about four years. That's what, okay. So uh, I enter, they call the postulancy, and uh, the period that I was there, here it was six weeks then, and then after postulancy, you go to novitiate, and when you enter novitiate is when you enter or receive your name in religion. So my name is Brother Christopher. And did so, you choose that? Yes, I did. I sub you submit three names to the abbot, and he picks the you know the one that you're going to live with. And Christopher happened to be my baptismal name, so I, I was happy that he let me keep that. So that was the novitiate, and that's when you officially receive canonical status. Like I'm officially a monk when I enter novitiate. Okay. So that's for a year and a day. And then after that, then you get temporary vows. Okay. I, I'm going to, I have so many questions for you, Brother Christopher, but I know we're running out of time. So I'm going to try to ask you a couple of quick ones. And I don't know if we can go over them quickly because I think they're just so important. But, you know, what has been the hardest part? Because you give up a lot when you become a monk. Has that been difficult letting go of worldly goods, worldly things? Oh, sure. I mean, yeah. I'm human. I spent, gosh, I went to work 18, 40 years acquiring stuff. I got my dream house and, you know, just being successful in the outside world. Mm -hmm. You know, I was uh, in retail, which, you know, I built a good clientele base and uh, worked for a major department store. So, you know, I get all, uh, got my house, all the stuff, my car and everything. And then uh, when you're in the mon mon monastic life, you surrender it all. It's all surrendering to God. So, uh, yeah, and then separation from my family, separation from my friends, which is not the end. It just, it just changes my mm -hmm. relationship with my family has changed, my relationship with my friends have changed, I still communicate with them, and I probably, uh, entering religious life has been a blessing in so many ways because it has improved my relationships. And what about with God? Definitely improved my relationship with God. I can't forget that, because <laughs> that's why I did it. Well, I think that's probably all the time we have, and I think that's a great place to end. And Brother Christopher, thank you so much. This has been such a joy and a pleasure for um, me. You've been a blessing to me. Thank well, you've you. You've been a blessing to me, too. Thank, thank you, you for coming. Yeah, thank you for watching, sisters and saints. Welcome home. You're no longer alone. The only safe place is in the kingdom.